Hello. You are listening to Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. Welcome to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show, a weekly radio program that spotlights positive real estate development and neighborhood revitalization throughout Philadelphia. I'm your host, Derek Hengemill. Jumpstart Philly is a unique community development program that trains, mentors, networks, and provides funding to aspiring real estate developers in seven different Philadelphia neighborhoods, including Germantown, where the program was founded. Jumpstart believes that you can do well by doing good and focuses on removing neighborhood blight, scattered site rehab, creating a healthy mix of affordable and market rate housing, and avoiding gentrification through slow, steady growth and keeping wealth local. Interviews are conducted during Jumpstart Germantown's weekly Jump in Our series on Monday nights at 7 p.m., which are held via Zoom webinar. For more information about these events, check out the events page at jumpstartgermantown.com. This week, I am speaking with our Jumpstart Germantown inspector and Philly Office Retail's Director of Construction, Jaime Rodriguez, about the draw request process and what to expect during your first inspection. I hope you enjoy the conversation and be sure to check out the podcast version of this program at jumpstartgermantown.com slash media. With over 20 years of experience in the construction field, both as general contractor and project manager, Jaime Rodriguez is currently the director of construction for Philly Office Retail. Starting in 2008, Jaime has overseen the majority of Philly Office Retail's construction efforts as they have renovated a great quantity of mostly blighted, older, and underutilized properties in order to give them a new lease on life. Another hat that Jaime wears within the POR family is inspector for the Jumpstart Germantown and Jumpstart Philly programs. Jaime has personally conducted hundreds of draw inspections for the loan program as well as supported the program developers' efforts by sharing his years of experience with the borrowers in the program. So I'm sure some of you in the call have probably met Jaime before or, or will meet him soon if you if you follow on the Jumpstart path. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce him tonight so we can talk about the uh, draw request process. How's it going, Jaime? Hello, everyone. How are you? Cool. So uh, we, we have a lot to cover and, and I'll, I'll give you a chance to just kind of open it up here and maybe we can work through um, everything you need to know about a draw request process, and, and we'll probably speak a little bit specifically in terms of the jumpstart draw request process, um, since that's you know what you you do inspections for and, and what you know the most about. But I'm sure some of the the concepts can apply to other similar um, um, funding sources. Um, but so before we even get into the draw request process, there's a lot that comes before that, <laughs> um, and you were sure to be sure you were sure to em- emphasize that when we were kind of practicing for this session. Um, so one of those big things is the scope of work of a project, um, and that's something I'm sure everybody has heard, but might maybe not know exactly what it is or what it encompasses. Um, so maybe Jaime, you could start by just telling us what the scope of work is and and, and where that um, lies in, in your plans. So yeah, so so basically the scope of work is is a list. Uh, of work that allows you to fully focus in on the uh, necessary steps needed uh, to be accomplished in order to realize the vision that you have for for whatever project that you're working on. And uh, it's critical to get that um, as detailed as possible up front uh, because it does become a backbone for everything else that you do in the um, in the uh, project management process um, as you as you move forward. Mm-hmm. And that should really be like the first thing you get started on once you you kind of are dipping your toes into a project, right? It's yes. like the base mm-hmm. level of all of all your plans. Correct. Cool. And uh, like within that scope of work, what sorts of things uh, can you find? You know, it, obviously, like ch- ch- the physical changes you're going to make, but also the budget, I'm sure, and and uh, and funding mm-hmm. uh, or, or budget information, right? So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that'll, that helps you, you know, once you've um, identified a property that you want to work on, um, it allows you to sort of, you know, if you prioritize it correctly, um, you can identify, you know, and get rid of, you know, sort, sort of prioritize what's, what's absolutely necessary for the project, <clears throat> you know, helps you prioritize and focus on those things and then work down to the minutia of, what your vision is for the project and what you want to do with the finances that may be left over um, once you've identified, you know, obviously up front, you identify, you know, what you're going to purchase a property for. And then later, you know, how much you can possibly either sell or, or, or rent the property for. And then in, in between that, you have, you know, what's 
possibly it could be available for your construction budget and allows you to, to, to take those numbers and prioritize um, your list of items uh, to work on so that you can more effectively and quickly uh, make your plan for that property. Cool. So maybe you can walk us through what, what you would prioritize first, like what your very biggest, highest priority is when you start the project and then you can work your way down and, and tell us like what sort of the things that you, like you said, can be used for uh, with leftover money. <clears throat> um, so, so yeah, these being, you know, financial investments, um, you kind of sort of, you know, well, at least my conservative approach to um, looking at, at projects that I'm working on is to identify what's what's needed um, first, and then what I like later. So, what I like to do with the property later. So, um, I t in in my scope of work, I first look at you know any structural issues that this property may have. I look at and assess the exterior. Does it need a roof? Does it need you know brick pointing? Does it need anything on the exterior envelope of the property? Um, then I move on to mechanical systems. Does this house is the, is the wiring good? Is the HVAC unit good? Um, do I need to, you know, replace any amount, any amount of the plumbing or drainage? Um, those are the kind of things that I look at first and quickly try to assess, assess a, or contribute a value to those items before I start moving into what could I possibly do with the property? Because those first three line items are going to be, they, they, you don't have, a, you don't have a real choice about the, property is going to dictate to you what's necessary for, for, for that property. Right. And, and those, those first three items are typically your, your highest budgeted items, right? They're the ones right. that, right. so everything else is kind of dependent on you having those, those worked in there. In place, yeah. Right. And um, so, so working lower priority, like I'm, I'm assuming fixtures and kind of cosmetic things is, is where you get to play around with a little bit. Yes. Yes. Once you have that in place, you know, things like too, it's just, you know, as you, as you start to think about your layout and, and the design of your, of your property, as you want to see it finished, you do have to take in, into, into consideration of, you know, especially if you want to reconfigure um, your layout, you have to think about up front, where's you, where are your drainage lines going to be? Am I going to need to put in soffits and things for ductwork if I'm going from a, a radiator system to a, a you know, half forced air system. Mm -hmm. um, so the, all those things, it, it helps you to think about those things up front before you think about the layout. Because a lot of times you spend a lot of time and sometimes if you're, you're hiring an architect, they can give you a layout that may not work for the property that you're currently mm -hmm. um, trying to, to uh, do, do renovations to just because you can't get, you know, mechanical systems there. You can't get drainage lines or water lines or, or ductwork to that that location and, and that configuration, right? So, so how in depth, I get, or maybe not in depth, but how lengthy and kind of like drawn out should the scope of work be? Because I know, like in reviewing loan applications that come in for Jumpstart, we get some that the scope of work is just like a sentence, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, we're gonna add a bathroom, you know, change the flooring, X, Y, and it's like three simple things. Like obviously, that's not okay. Um, but, but how, like, do people really need to write up like a 10 page scope of work or, or what do you think is an appropriate amount for someone to somebody to plan out there? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's, uh, you know, and we could talk about this. We'll talk about this more later when you talk about budgets and, and schedules and things, you kind of sort of want to put your, you do want to put your, your, your uh, scope of work together as an outline and right. you know, have bullet points, but you definitely want to break those bullet points down as much as possible. Um, so that- so it's, all right, end, it's all right for it to be like, it's all right for it to kind of be like a, a, a not stripped down, but like you said, bullet points. It doesn't need to be like a, a book of- a Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, you know, depending on the size of the project, you know, a, a, a scope of work, maybe a, a page or two worth of bullet right. points. Right. But the important thing is that those like those big questions, like you said, those that that list of priorities, like every caveat that you're going to need to do should should be in there in some form. Correct. Yes. Cool. Um, so is, is a scope of work, you know, we'll move on from this in a second, but is a scope of work something that a developer or a borrower can do themselves or do they need the contractor there for that? Or is the contractor involved before the scope of work is even, you know, like where, where does the contractor yeah. play, play into the, the scope of work? Yeah, I would say if it's your first time, 
Um, being a developer, it's, it's probably very important that you get a contractor involved early, uh, mm -hmm. even before you identify like the prop, uh, the properties. Mm -hmm. um, if you're shopping around and, and you're asking the right questions, they're going to sort of, you know, talk about and brag about the good, the things that they're good at. And, you know, uh, and, and so you can match certain contractors to certain properties. And, and, and if you create the, those relationships up front and you're comfortable with the person that you're walking through the property, you can do it quickly. And that uh, contractor is only going to help you accelerate that, that process of creating your scope of work. Right. And, and I guess if the contractor is involved in the creation of the scope of work, that's less than you, that's less you have to fill them in on later. <laughs> yes. Know, yes Right. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we have the, the we, we've had the circumstances where, you know, a, a borrower, um, you know, has a general feeling about what they, they like to do. And then they, they talk to contractors and mm -hmm. and uh, the vision evolves quite a bit between what they originally thought and, you know, got the loan on and what they, you know, ended up contracting uh, uh, a contractor to do for them. And those things become very difficult to manage during the, the, the construction process and the draw process, especially when you're trying to recover funds so that you can keep the project uh, moving. Right. And, and contractors, they can also help you find, or, or can they also help you find like the, the appropriate costs for sort of things? Like they know oh, these things are going to take yeah. more, maybe less. And that, yeah, certainly if you don't, yeah, if you don't have that experience in construction, they're definitely going to be very, a, a very valuable resource. Um, to provide you with those with those items, especially on the um, absolutely needed list, you know the structural, the exterior, the mechanical, they're going to be able to quickly give you numbers on those things and establish, you know, where your thresholds are for that project, so that you can either eliminate or move forward quickly. So you definitely don't want to be spinning your wheels on a on a property that needs too too much, uh, you know, um, you know, base work. Um, that you really can't, you know, do the, the, the things that you want to do in order to make that, that, that property more marketable. Cool. Uh, great. So, so moving on from scope of work, maybe we can talk about budgets now and, and, and sort of the financial aspect of a construction project As, aside from the creative and, and sort of like physical changes you're making. There's a, mm -hmm. a huge financial aspect that is really important to, to keep in mind. Um, so, so how should one bake, break their budget down and, and, and can they get creative with it? Is there like a format for, you know, this is the list of things you need to budget. This is exactly the dollar amounts that those things are going to cost or, or, or just what are people's options for creating a budget, you know? Um, so, yeah, if, well, when I say, uh, and, I, and I alluded this uh, to this earlier is when you create a good scope of work, mm -hmm. um, you can combine uh, uh, like items together and budget them under a category like carpentry or kitchen or bathroom or et cetera. Um, which may may make your you know budget um, you know smaller and concise in order to you know deal with the loan, but you can be as creative as you want with with that budget. One of the things that I often tell borrowers when we go into that you know first draw and it's the first time they've done a loan with us is, hey, you know in the future if you do this with us, you don't necessarily need to fall within the exact budget categories that um, are given on that sample. Uh, that we provide for, for a budget, um, you can make that as detailed or as or as undetailed as you want. You can remove categories that that don't apply to your job in order to make um, it easier for you to understand and control your budget. Um, you know, I would I, I would say that it is it is you know at least for me it's 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 better to have more than less on on your budget. Um, and, you know, like I said, a, a good scope of work is going to help you there. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure there's an upper limit of that. Right? You don't want to have like. Yeah, you don't want to have a budget that's two pages. Right. Um, but you certainly want to, um, you know, you definitely want to break down and be aware of, you know, for example, if you decide to have a carpentry budget, mm -hmm. you know, what I've seen, what I, you know, I've had the experience of coming into inspections mm -hmm. And for example, having a borrower uh, drawing 100% of carpentry because they've framed everything out, and to them, that's 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 all that it that's all that is, and that's all they plan for. Um, a good scope of work would have told you, hey, you need to put in, you know, trim and doors and 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 all that kind of stuff that still has to be installed. And so, um, 
you signed a contract with a contractor, he wants to get paid a hundred percent of his carpentry and you have, you know, your line item for that, for that budget. But, you know, I come in and I look at that and I'm like, well, you framed, you probably, you're probably only about 75 complete, uh, 75% complete here on, on, on this line item. And, and that's where, you know, you, you have that aha moment, like, oh, you, you know, maybe I should have, you know, written down my scope better or whatever. And so, but yeah, we, we deal with it as we go along. Cool. And, and it sounds like, um, that all of this just kind of amounts to making it easier for yourself, <laughs> making it yes, easier. Yes. Not, so, so one thing that I imagine it is hard is to get that budget locked in stone. So right before you start construction, you know, that is what you're working off of. That's like, that's what you're stuck. It's, is it, so, cause my question here is, is it, is that a rigid budget? You know, is that something halfway through you can say, Oh, I put too much money in this. I got to reallocate this. Like, um, yeah, I, I know, I know different lenders are, are, are have different rules and, and guidelines for that. Um, but maybe you can speak from your yeah. experience. Like is, is there changes made to the budget after it's, it's the yeah. project? Is- yeah. I mean, it, it, it is possible and you always want to stay within your, within your, you know, original budget amount. Like you can't just, we can't just reallocate a budget. Um, we, we wouldn't allow to just reallocate a budget um, and increase amounts um, because you, you, you do have that limitation of the return on investment, you know, when you originally plan, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so when you originally apply for the loan and we, we try to make, you know, to stick to it. Um, what I would say, you know, and it's happened a few times is we're, we're sort of flexible, especially at the, at the first draw mm-hmm. um, to reallocate. Usually when I come in, because I'm not originally the, the one who assesses the original budget for that project. I just come in at the first draw. As I'm asking questions of that borrower uh, about, um, you know, what's in their budget and what they've planned for and what they haven't planned for. And it becomes sometimes obvious that, you know, some changes and reallocations need to be made. I usually make the suggestions like, hey, I can, I can try to, you know, put in a report for what I see as far as completion based up, up on this visit. But uh, what I suggest to you is to go back to Angie, have the discussion with her, try to reallocate your budget items um, so that uh, we can improve the right completion amounts and, 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 and fund you more adequately for, for the project as it stands today. Cause you know, unfortunately it's just the reality of the world. Sometimes, you budget for one thing and then you do, especially after you've done demolition and you realize you have two or three broken joists, or you didn't realize that, you know, somebody at some point had replaced all the wire in the basement and all the, all the, all the wire that you saw in the house is brand new, but then you open up the walls and everything else is knob and tube. And not all of a sudden you have to rewire the entire house. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's often good. Like we want to see the borrower succeed. So we're willing to sort of have that discussion about how we can reallocate and sort of realign some things on the project to make the project actually successful. And unfortunately that's, that sometimes means that we have to make sacrifices on, like I said, some of the layout or design, um, you know, aspects of the project in order to take care of these, you know, immediate and absolute needs for the, for that, for that property. Right. Right. And we're going to get into the, the draw request process in a bit and, and how people interact with you. But I just want to, you know, that's what you just said is the huge value of, of having you there at the first inspection is because you have all these years of experience and you've seen all these different loans and projects going through. So as 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 hard as uh, Angie and Adriana and I can attempt at uh, guessing and, and kind of like seeing these numbers and saying, OK, this works and our research based on, um, you know, mm-hmm. we've seen it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything until you, you get there with the borrower and you're standing in the property and you're able to like visually point out <laughs> what's yeah. wrong. Oh, it's, it's, it's hard for me on the, of my first draw, you know, for those who might, who might be on the jumping are, you know, they, they know that I always ask like, you know, Hey, like what, what's in your budget? Is this just material or is this labor? Or is this, cause you know, I don't, I, I don't know coming in if you have some sort of storage unit somewhere full of all the materials for that project and, and, or, you know, like, or if you're doing, you know, there's no labor in your budget because you're a self performer and you're going to do this thing, this whole thing yourself. You know, I, I have no way 
of knowing whether that budget is is adequate until I've asked all the questions when I'm there on site. So, you know, for, for, for you guys that are considering doing a loan with us and it's going to be your first time, you know, seeing me at one of your properties, when you see me ask the questions, uh, definitely don't be afraid of, of my questions. I'm only trying to understand your project so that I can figure out how to help you. All right. So, so we're going to get into that in a, in a minute, once we talk about the draw process and, and like I, like you said, why you're asking so many questions and why, why you're there four times throughout the project. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to wrap up what we were talking about budgeting and, and move on to something about scheduling. And, and maybe you could tell me about like what the schedule for a project typically looks like and, um, and how you kind of decide what, what that schedule um, will be. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to the scope of work, um, just like the budget, it always, I mean, I try as much as possible in, my, in, a, in the way that I do my, my project management is, and that's why I harp on the, the scope of work so much is my scope of work, my budget and my, and my schedule, they all follow the same backbone of that, of that scope of work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it, 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 it's easy to, especially when handling cash flow to sort of figure out when I, you know, when I need money for what aspect of the project, you know, at which time, you know, dur- during the phase, what, whether I should be giving deposits or not and, and, and all that. Um, so I would say, you know, if you have your outline, um, you know, broken down, then, then you can, you know, s- you schedule all the different items according to, to the appropriate time. You definitely want to get your um, contractor involved in that process. Because it's good you, during that process. While while you're having that conversation, you already have a budget in place. You're trying to put your schedule together. Mm-hmm. That contractor already starts to do the numbers in, in, in his brain and say, "Well, I, I'm going to need this money at this time, and I'm and I can expect to receive this money at, at X time." Right. And you guys can formulate a, a, a plan that better best suits you know each individual and that project to get that project done. If you're just tuning in, this is a conversation with our Jumpstart Germantown inspector and Philly Office Retail's Director of Construction, Jaime Rodriguez, about the draw request process and what to expect during your first inspection. Thanks for listening to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show on Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. I hope you're enjoying the discussion. All right, so that leads perfectly to my next question, which was uh, how and when should you pay your contractor? You know, you said these he's involved or he or she is involved right from the beginning with the scope of work. Like, w- at what point do they start to, to kind of be a, a paid employee of yours? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, just just for the sake of now is the first time, you know, uh, you know, um, investors here, you know, it's actually illegal in the state of Pennsylvania to require uh, a 50% deposit, which is very common, mm-hmm. you know, t- you know, it's a very common occurrence, but if you, um, if you don't feel comfortable, you know, like if you've never used a, that's, this contractor before and you don't know what kind of relationship, you definitely want to be putting as little money as possible in his hand um, up front. Um, so you can use that as a tool. Now, if this is somebody that you've used um, that you, that you've used, uh, you know, in, on, on other projects or in, in your personal home or whatever, and you, you can really trust that person, then, you know, that's that the deposits and all that are, are at your discretion. Um, you just need to be aware of, of your, you know, like I said, your budget and your schedule so that, you know, you're not, pu- you're putting out from your own pocket as little, um, money as possible up front before you re- require, uh, recover some funds after that first draw. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you, you and your contractor are talking about these things up front and sort of laying the groundwork for what's going to come next, there's very, there's hopefully going to be very little surprises along the way. And it makes it so much easier and better for everyone going forward. Um, huh. but I would definitely say like, once you've got, once you've gotten your budget, I, I've even, you know, encouraged people as soon as you have a budget, you should probably, you know, put your draw sheets, all four draw sheets together based on your expectations and then revise as you go. Right. Because you know, you'll know you know upfront who's getting money when and when you need X right. money. 
Right. And that'll that that'll re- relieve as relieve as much pressure as possible during construction because that that construction process is going to be enough stress of its own. Right. Right. Awesome. I think that's a that's a great tip is to kind of pre-plan as far as head is doing all your draw sheets and and, mm-hmm. and the change once you have something in there that you kind of know you expected. Um, yeah. Cool. So uh, before we move on to the the meat meat of this uh, session, which is going to be the draw request process. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we are going to have a Q&A session in about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. So be sure to type in your questions um, at the bottom. I know there's, a, there's about 10 people who joined us since we started. Um, so if you uh, have any questions or anything you missed, you can type it in the Q&A and we'll get to it once we're wrapped up here. Um, so, so moving on, uh, you know, for those who don't know, I, I hope everybody in this uh, call has some idea of what a draw is and what that means in the construction world. But in case there's anybody who doesn't, uh, maybe you can just start by explaining what is the draw process and, uh, you know, what, what that means. Um, yeah, so with every draw, you get you get four draws um, for each loan um, that are uh, programmed or, you know, already included in, in your, in, in your you know, loan documentation. Um, if you go, it, it is possible to have uh, more draws than just the four. Uh, if needed, but each additional above the four would cost uh, 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 a one-time processing fee of uh, $250 uh, per additional inspection. Uh, I just want to point out real quick that what Jaime is talking about is for Jumpstart. So I'm sure some of this might apply to other like lending groups or, or people who do draw requests, but we're going to just stick with Jumpstart because you know that's what we're, we're familiar with and what most people will use. Um, yeah, so, sorry about that, Jaime, go on. No apologies. Yeah, so... so so and, and, and we'll get to this. I guess you know, I guess it's, it's helpful to say, just just reiterate what what uh, Derek said is you know the reason why we we do the draw process the that way that we do it is because it's very similar to identical to what you would have on a on a conventional loan, and so we want to encourage you and empower you to do this on your own in the future and not just be dependent on our program. Um, so we try to keep. You know the whole uh, loan documentation and draw process, um, the same or, or almost the same as as uh, what you would have on a typical loan. Um, so you know the draw po- process on a typical loan. Uh, you know the 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 inspector for the bank would come in um, when you uh, put in your 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 draw request, and um, the inspector is basically there to establish percent complete to date based upon what you've reported as being complete on your draw sheet. Mm-hmm. So once you've, you know, you know, typically because, you know, just in our program, because we have those predetermined for, for inspections, um, you, when you get about 25% complete, um, and again, you can be creative and manage your cash flow the way that you want and, and, and strategize about when the appropriate time for you is to have your, your draw. But typically you would get to about, through about 25% of, of, that, of that project. You have to, out of um, your personal funds, um, uh, float that first 25% of that project or that first draws worth of that project. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, after I certify that indeed the percent complete is, you know, equivalent to what's represented on that draw sheet, um, you would be uh, um, uh, sent a check or, you know, have a wire deposit for the amount of funds within that draw uh, within three to five days of me doing the inspection. Right. So the money, the money is always dispersed after the construction is complete. It's, it's not like. Correct. Or after that, whatever that the that budget items construction is complete. So it's not like it's not like you're showing up to the draw request and you're saying, okay, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to start doing these windows. So I'm requesting that it's it works backwards. Okay. Correct. So, so it's it's always we're always funding the project retro, retroactively. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, an important thing to note is, for example, like when I show up, the 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 work has to be done, mm-hmm. or the material that you've paid for has to be on site. And that's very important. A lot of times, you know, people have, you know, paid, for example, for a deposit on their cabinetry. And unless that, unless those cabinets are there on site, we typically do not 
uh, fund uh, those those monies that you're out uh, on that deposit um, until those cabinets are there. Um, so let me ask you, Jaime, what happens if the cabinets aren't there? You know, what happens if you, you show up and, and there's maybe only like 10% of the work done? Yeah, so I mean, this is where like you want to start preparing for your, um, you, you want to start preparing for your draw as far as in advance as you can, um, but not too, too far. I would say like a, a, a tip, it's typically good to uh, put in your draw within a, a week of where you want, where, where you want the inspection to be mm-hmm. um, so that you have plenty of time. Like the best thing for you, if you're really counting on that, that like specific amount of money to keep going is to hit that landmark of completion before you have the draw. Cause otherwise I'm coming in, I'm only able to establish, you know, a percentage of, of what you've represented. And then you have to have another inspection at some point to make up for that, that shortfall. Right. Um, so, so typically even, even a day ahead of, of, of having the inspection, if you know, you're not going to make your completion goal for that draw mm-hmm. um, before the, before I go out there, just cancel. It's, it's okay. Just call, cancel the, the inspection and reschedule it mm-hmm. for, you know, a few days down the line. There's no, there's no harm, no foul there. Right. Um, but if I show up on site, um, the fee, you know, there, there could be additional fees. Um, you either have to wait until your, 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 your next draw, or you would have to have, have an addi- additional ins- um, inspection, um, uh, based on, you know, your financial needs for that project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you, and I think it's important to highlight that point you made that, um, you're not, you shouldn't include anything in your draw request that you're not sure if is going to be done by the time Jaime is going to show up. <laughs> right. Uh, that should all be stuff that is like locked and loaded, ready to go. It, it's, it's no, without a doubt done. Cool. Um, so, so um, I'm trying to, okay. I, I lost track there for a second, but I got, it. Um, we should next talk about, you know, like how do people work through that process? And you, know, you said that they send the, the lender, the, the draw request sheet, and then they come out. How does that work with Jumpstart? You know, like what is the timing between somebody submitting their draw sheet, you coming out and then getting the funds? I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit there. there. I was just saying, I was just saying, if you could describe the process from when people submit a a draw request sheet to when they're going to get the funds, you know, like what is the timing like on that? Um, So yeah, so when you you know would you obviously that would depend on when you start you know requesting the draw, but you know once I show up, um, typically um, I'll have the inspection report in the same day. Mm-hmm. Um, and it usually, like I said, like most, I would say most, uh, you know, most draws are funded within three days. We, we have that extra couple of days buffer just mm-hmm. in case uh, there's some discussion that needs to happen between mm-hmm. yourself and the loan officer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but typically three, three to five days, uh, the draw is uh, funded. Cool. And, um, and I know you, you mentioned this before we started uh, or before we, or when we had our little uh, practice session before this, but uh, we really should highlight the, the importance of why we do this um, draw process, you know, rather than just what it is or, or how people use it. Like this is something that's really especially good for new developers because it, it's not necessarily handholdy, but it really checks everything. Right. It, and it keeps everything in balance and makes sure that you're not, you're not off on some pipe dream. Right. Correct. Yeah. It, is, it gives you, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's like everything, you know, in sports, you have your, you know, you have your, you know, li- you know, scrimmage lines, you have your out of bounds, you, you know, you, there's, it, there's certain goalposts that are set for you during this draw po- process that just help you think through your project right. as you're dealing with the challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause they, they are certain to come, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be something that tries to knock that project off course and you just having, you know, that, 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 uh, draw schedule there, um, at, at, you know, and, and those goalposts, it, it kind of sort of helps you make certain decisions, you know, correctly. And, you know, there's a reason why the industry follows the system, right? It's, it's, it's a tried and true, uh, system and we try to hold to it, um, again, in order to get you to a point where you feel comfortable, 
going out and getting a loan based on your credit um, and, you know, maybe hopefully have some better, you know, loan terms as a result of going that route versus doing a program like ours. Right. So I guess the opposite of a draw process would be just dispersing all the funds at once and saying, Hey, here's all your money, do it. And we'll see at the yeah, end. Yeah. The, the, the thing you're really lacking there is, is Jaime's expertise in the, in these regular check-ins where you're yeah. kind of like yeah. constantly being uh, evaluated. Right. Yeah. There, there's very few loans like that. Um, and those that, that do exist like that have outrageous interest rates um, right. that go along with it. So if, if, for some reason you get all the money and something goes wrong, you, you lose pretty big in the end. Right. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to understand that it's not, it's not because we're, we don't trust that you're going to use the money the way we say it, or it's not because we don't want to give you the money until we're sure that it's going to be used properly. It's because we want you to do the best job that you can do. Right. And, and we want you to be able to, to have control over that rather than um, like you said, getting into a deal with a high interest rate and, and you're kind of like left out to drive. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. So, and so those, and, and, and in today's economy, those kind of those kind of de- like financing deals are very far and few in between. Cool, cool. Um, so we're we're just about wrapped up here, but I just want to kind of let you uh, provide any information that you might have about the draw process and what you can um, you know suggest for people. What tips you have um, specifically? Maybe if you could talk about that first draw, because I know you said it earlier that that's really the the crux of, of the reason why we do the draw process um, when you first get there. So like, what sorts of questions will you ask? And uh, maybe you can just kind of explain what, what, what your perspective is from it and any tips or tricks you might have for people. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, so typically when I c- come in to do the first draw, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, you know, the, the three questions that typically help me the most in assessing where you are with your budget and and with your project. Um, Not only do I like to ask these questions just for the sake of the project, it's also to max, ultimately you're you're in this to make money. So I like to use my expertise and because I do all of the inspections um, and at least in the Germantown and uh, Northwest section of the city, I'm very familiar with the, that the, 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 all the projects going around in the neighborhood and what the values are, what's working for some investors, what's not. So I'll ask, my first question is, you know, is, is this going to be a rental or is this a flip? Mm-hmm. Um, so, because I'll have, you know, certain advice for you, uh, you know, in order to maybe rethink your plan a little bit based on those two things, you, you, you're going to have a different market in a rental uh, uh, different needs, you know, the property is going to have different needs for rental than it is for, for, for a sale. Um, I'll also, you know, go through and ask you, you know, line item by line item, what's in, what's in your budget? You know, do you, do you have money for this? Do you have money for that? Um, are you doing this work yourself? You know, uh, you're purchasing, you know, all of these items are, you, is your contractor purchasing all the, these items or are you, um, and I'll definitely, you know, depending on your 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 answer, I might lean you towards it. For example, you know, most contractors are going to charge you about fifteen percent um, on top of whatever they spend on material, you know, just as a service fee and, and transport. And so, you know, they they have real expenses too. They have to pay for gas to get from, you know, Home Depot or whatever else they're, you know, wherever else they're buying stuff to to get it to your project. So. You know, like I'll, I'll ask you those sort, sorts of questions to see, like if 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 I feel that the budget may be particularly tight, I'll I'll say, you know, hey, you might want to think about ordering these materials yourself, yourself and having them delivered by the supplier rather than having your contractor buy these, so you can save some money here or there. Um, you know, I'll I'll ask you, um, you know, you know, again, I alluded to this earlier in, in carpentry, people tend to sort of forget, you know, I've gotten used to people, borrowers, you know, forgetting certain, you know, aspects of, of, of a diff, of a certain ca- uh, cost category, like carpentry or plumbing. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the, some of the, the scopes may overlap, like some people might just have a blank item that says bathrooms, kitchens, and plumbing. Well, you know, I want. I would like to know whether you have, um, 
your, for example, the installation of your, you know, faucets and, and, and toilet fixtures in your bathroom budget or in your plumbing budget. Cause then I'm going to judge the consequent, um, uh, draws based upon those answers that you gave me on that first, that first draw. Um, so, you know, and I, like try to do a pretty good job of remembering everybody's answers so that as we go along in the project, I'm not asking the same questions again, and I'm giving advice based upon those, those past answers to keep, try to keep things consistent and, uh, you know, help you sort of, you know, try to, uh, keep a sense of, uh, uh, of order and of rapport with, with the borrower. Cool. Um, so, so next, just what we'll end on here is, is what to avoid during the draw request process. And maybe you can tell me what are some common pitfalls. And I think you just mentioned a couple of them there, but, but what are really like the things that you see that, that you're like, this has got to stop. I don't know why people keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, just, like I said, just talk, you know, talk to your, con especially if you're using a contractor, talk to your contractor to make sure what's included. No question is a stupid question because ultimately as the borrower and as the owner of that project, you're going to be paying for that. So, um, so you may, you know, make sure that you have your finished carpentry in, in your budget that your, that your contractor, for example, is caulking between dissimilar materials like you know caulking between your drywall and your trim and stuff like that you'd you you wouldn't believe how many you know um conversations i've had about those things you want to make sure that in your carpentry items that you you know that you include you know having to replace a stairway or railings things like that um that you kind of sort of typically when you're trying to put together a project quickly um, to get to, to, to a loan, a lot, many people just kind of skip over that. Um, the more you get your, your scope of work down in the beginning and then in consequent projects, you can basically just revise that scope of work and knock a couple of things off and add a couple of things. So it becomes something that, that evolves over time and you don't have to do from scratch every single time. Um, so I would, I would try to start off with a general scope and then tailor it down to your so that you can continue to use that scope and not reinvent the wheel every time. Um, I would say uh, common pitfalls are evaluate your, your plumbing, especially. I've been to, you know, probably over 10 uh, projects uh, where they've, uh, the borrower has finished completely painting and almost finishing the project. And then I show up in that last draw and sure enough, there's a wall that's that's just been cut open to replace the uh, the plumbing stacks. Um, if you have those old steel stacks, and for and, and especially if you've taken the drywall or plaster off the off of everything, don't try to skimp on 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 those kind of things. If the wall's open, replace that stack, get it replaced. It's ultimately a big risk that you take on if you've you know, like I said, almost close to finished. And uh, that's not done. Um, again, I think I alluded to this earlier, just, you know, assessing your systems, you know, plumbing, heating, electrical. Um, those, those are going to be big ticket items. Um, and, and then thirdly, your roof. Uh, sorry, lastly, your roof should be something that you assess and not try to take chances on. It's very likely that if there are maybe slight issues during that construction uh, period, especially if you're doing the construction during the winter time, that roof is gonna become an issue because you'll likely not have a heated house and not having a heated property is going to cause damage to that property, especially the roof. Um, so those are things that you just kind of sort of wanna, Want to make sure you take care of no matter what when you when it comes down to defining your scope and, your, and taking account into your budgets. Um, the 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 other thing that I would say is you know keep keep close guard of your schedule. Um, like I said, the, the the construction process is very is very um, is very stressful in and in and of itself. Um, but if you keep a close guard of your schedule, it's gonna it's going to decrease the amount of costs that you have overall 
and it's definitely going to decrease the amount of financing fees that you have as a result of, of your loan. Once you've taken a draw on a certain amount of money, say like I've, you've done your first draw and, um, and you've, you know, you've drawn 25% of that budget, that 25% that you just drew started accruing uh, interest the moment that you got, that you got funded for that amount on that draw, um, you know, in the second, third draw. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, this is something that's, that, that's a real, that it's, it's a real thing, uh, you know, now with COVID, like, you know, you know, it's just a reality of things. If there's a shutdown and you're waiting three months, guess what? There might be some interest fees that you're, you're paying because you weren't able to touch your property for two or three months. Mm-hmm. Um, so, trying to do a really good job with your schedule is very important. Um, it's um, interest is not something that like most people sort of like, you know, add two and two equals four, you know, while they're in the process. It's just this abstract idea. And then when you see it at the end, it becomes a real number. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's scary. That concludes my conversation with our Jumpstart Germantown inspector and Philly Office Retail's Director of Construction, Jaime Rodriguez, about the draw request process and what to expect during your first inspection. The interviews on this program are recorded during Jumpstart Germantown's weekly Jumpinar series, which takes place via Zoom webinar every Monday night at 7 p.m. If you'd like to participate in the live Q&A with our guest, be sure to head to jumpstartgermantown.com events and register for next week's Jumpinar. If you're interested in starting a Jumpstart program in your own community, you can visit gojumpstart.org and see our how-to guide and open source training workbook. Thanks so much for listening to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show on Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. And be sure to tune in next week.